This conference will now be recorded. Well, welcome to week four of House and Home. We're so grateful you decided to spend some time with us. My name is Scott Fusell, and I am the Director of Education for CSL Management. I'm also the host of House and Home. Uh, I'm a Beta Theta Pi from Middle Tennessee State University, where I had an absolutely life-changing fraternity experience. And I am really, really grateful that you guys decided to spend some time with us today as we get into talking about communication plans, what, when, and why we need to be communicating with our students, with our members, with our residents, and with their families. So alongside me today is, uh, as always, is Christina Kinzer, and she's our Senior Operations Specialist here at CSL. She's also my right arm when it comes to our education department here at CSL and helps them with a lot of our programming. Uh, for the purposes of today, she will again be serving as our chat management wizard. And so if you have a question today, we wanna make sure you hop into that chat room uh, ask whatever questions come to mind. We're going to do the best we can to address those at the end of today's session. And uh, but just to kind of cut down and help us to manage the noise and the background noise of some of the feedback, uh, we'll have everybody in a in a listen only mode today. And uh, but if you have questions along the way, please hop into that chat room, ask your question. Christina will uh, take a note of that, and then a little bit later on in our session, we will jump in and. Uh, manage as many or answer as many of those questions as we possibly can. So I do want to start off really quickly by, as we do every week, we want to make sure you know how grateful we are that you chose to be with us today. Uh, by showing up, again, that reveals to us every single week that you care deeply about these facilities, you care deeply about these students, you care deeply about the experience that we are preparing for them. So that says a lot about your commitment to your organization and commitment to this movement. And so I need you to know how grateful we are for the good work that you do. It matters and it's more relevant. It's more necessary than it's ever been. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for everything that you've been doing and everything that you're doing going forward. So as I mentioned earlier, today's session is all about what, when, and why to communicate with uh, our members and especially their families. So. Let's talk a little bit about what you can expect today. Here are a few of the things that we're going to cover. Uh, first off, we're really going to dive into man, why, why having a communication plan is so important. Uh, we're going to offer you some recommendations in terms of what to share with your people. And we're going to give you an overview of uh, some of what our food service providers, our kitchen management companies have been sharing because we have changes that are happening that we have got to communicate from the chapter room to the dining room. We got to be communicating all of those changes with our members and with their families so they feel so super secure and comfortable knowing that they are going to be moving back into an environment that is safe, healthy, happy, and is ready for them to thrive as a student, as a person, and as a, as a member of your organization. So uh, that's kind of the roadmap of, uh, of our conversation today. So. Um, one of the things that you know and we talk about this every week what do we want you to get out of these sessions uh we always want you to leave in these sessions feeling connected confident and compelled and we do that by providing relevant information um, that reminds you that uh, you are not in this alone that we are all in this together and if you can leave here with three or four new tactics that uh, help you to be more ready than you were when you showed up then man that is a gigantic win today so we have been talking the last few weeks about roadmaps and recommendations, have been talking really at a strategic level about some of the things that we need to be considering. Today, we're gonna to kind of put some meat around those bones. So we're gonna dive into providing you some tactics for those strategies and provide you some steps that go along with those roadmaps. And uh, we're, we're thrilled about what this session is going to enable you to do and to communicate with your members and their families. So again, we want to provide some clarity in terms of what this communication should look like, what you should be communicating, and hopefully that provides some confidence where you can actually step in, work with your local house corporation, work with your national house corporation, and really solidify yourself as a really viable partner in this process. Um, again, none of us know as much as all of us. It's taken all of us to team together, to work together, to partner together, to make sure that we are prepared for this fall because it is uncertain. It is uh, a different situation than we've ever experienced before. So if we can help provide a few tools that enable you to be a stronger partner with the team that you're working with, man, that is a gigantic win for today. So really wanna encourage you to lean in to your role as a powerful partner 
in this thing we call fraternity and sorority. So making a return appearance today, no surprise, is Woody Ratterman. He's our managing partner here at CSL Management. He's going to be providing some color uh, to some of the content that we shared today, and it will have a few things to share with you from a bigger picture at the end of our session. But we're really excited today to introduce our, our, our guest speaker, Bill Reeder. Uh, Bill is the president for Campus Cooks, and he's a Phi Psi from Northwestern University. He has spent, uh, like many of us, has spent the last three months really figuring out, okay, how do we close down our, our homes and our kitchens and our dining rooms really quickly? And how do we get our members and our kitchens and our staffs ready for what this fall is gonna look like? So he spent a lot of time developing communication plans for uh, his, not only his staff, but what he's communicating out with, with his client base and has is, is really developed a really wonderful uh, overview of what we should be sharing with our members and our teams as well. So uh, with that being said, I wanna say uh, thanks so much to Bill for carving out some time for us today. Turn it over to him. Bill, take it away. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Scott, for that wonderful introduction. Well, with all of us, the past 90 days, you know, beginning mid-March, it's literally been drinking from a fire hose. You know, none of this was planned. It all came about rather quickly. And at that point in time, communication had to start. Had to start not only for current clients, had to start for students, had to begin with employees. So you had, you know, at that point, we, you were getting out information. Everyone was looking for guidance, for leadership. And so from that point in time, we've been putting out communications over the past 90 days. And one of the key parts of communication and part of the guidelines we've been going by is developing a cadence, meaning we're trying to do it timely, but also where it's expected. So we've been putting our communication about every 15 days and talking in general yet specific terms. You know, you do have to paint a broad brush, but yet people are worrying about the, how they're individually affected. So some of those guidelines I want to talk about today is not only the guidelines, but also how this session can help you create a communication plan as you prepare for the fall opening. You know, I want to create a blueprint for you to have effective communication, a roadmap, as you begin to open up your chapters for the fall. You know, we're going to offer suggestions, not only myself, Woody, and Scott, but also when and what you're communicating to your returning members as they prepare for their fall return. Uh, a couple of things I really want you to think about, and I would challenge you, you know, we're in a period of anxiety and uncertainty. And how do you assure your students the execution of a safe environment upon their return to school? And the second thing, you know, how do you make someone's son or daughter feel safe in this new environment? And that's what we're trying, uh, you know, that is the goal. So as you look at your communication, and when we talk about the importance of having and executing a communication, again, we want it to be consistent. That means two, four, six, eight weeks to service. We want to provide news and updates, information, helpful content as the situation develops. We want to utilize our vendors for materials they can provide to outline steps in the process that work keeping everyone healthy. You want to provide updates from the national organization and from the university. And one of the things that I've tried to do is stay in my lane. There's a lot going on, uh, you know, from a legal, from a financial, from, um, you know, uh, not only from health departments, the food service, the cleaning services, just kind of understand that we can be specific, but yet general, because we don't have all the answers and these situations are fluid. So that's one of the things that we've really, uh, you know, been aware of as we've communicated. So as you see from the slide here, you know, some of the touch points we want to talk about is we want to communicate to all our constituents. It's key. You know, now more than ever, people need the information and they just want to know to know. Uh, we want to share what we have done. We want to share what we're going to do. And also we want to provide clarity and confidence in our plans and expectations. As you look, as we develop this timeline, we're looking at nine weeks out. You know, we want to share from a local house corporation perspective and as well from facility managers and house directors, what have we done and what we, and what we will do. Uh, this is important for myself. 
as an Illinois Alpha uh, chapter advisor and a part of the House Corporation Board. Uh, we're kind of lucky that our start date is mid-September. For those of you that start earlier in August, this will just provide, you know, you just have to ramp up quicker. But we're already getting questions of what the fall looks like, you know, how are you preparing the chapter, what's the living situation. So we're really introducing, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> our preparation for the start. How we're going to clean the chapter, with what regularity, uh, how the rooms are going to be cleaned, the bathrooms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also you're preparing them for how it's going to be different. You know, the term used to be social distancing, now it's physical distancing. What does that mean? How will their experience be a little bit different? Uh, it is a new normal. And, you know, displaying an understanding and empathy that at this time you're not able to provide all the answers and details. Because if you're like me, I'm waiting on what Northwestern's guidance is going to be, or from a national guidance, or from a local guidance. You're doing the best you can to provide what you know at this moment uh, to, to make them feel safe. Scott, can I jump in here just for a second? Um, Anytime. Yeah, Bill, and this is something we taught beforehand in going through this, is if you did not participate in the Wednesday call, Pennington did a great call with Fraternal Law Partners that answered in a 45-minute window pretty succinctly a lot of the legal concerns and questions that house corporations and national organizations are facing right now. And one of the things that they brought up, which was very timely as it relates to Bill's presentation here today on communication, was a, the reminder that we have to be very careful. Uh, and as you're watching and you're seeing your house corporations and national organizations uh, provide recommendations and start communicating to residents and their parents and, and to the members at large, is that whatever we put in writing, we have to make very certain that we're actually going to be able to do and that we do execute it. There's actual case laws where house corporations have sent letters to parents welcoming them back. One, one in particular that they mentioned during the call was a fraternity, a house corp president. He sent a letter to the parents saying, look, we know in the past there's been challenges at our facility. Some of our social uh, events have gotten out of hand. Uh, please know that uh, moving forward, we're going to rein this in and we're going to do all these things. And unfortunately, it was, there was a tragic incident where a young man got paralyzed at one of their parties. And certainly, lo and behold, during the lawsuit and everything, this particular letter that he communicated to parents in advance of them coming to school, stating the house corporation was going to do all these things, which again, the house corporation and the chapter are two different scenarios and the house corporations don't necessarily have any ability as it relates to the social aspects of what is the chapters choose to do but certainly in the court of law they said you know you just said here that you were going to ensure that none of this stuff was going to happen and it did so it's just really important as a reminder as we're developing these communications as we're putting things out there in writing that whatever we're saying we're going to do that we actually do or anything that we're saying that we can't do, uh, we're, we're being mindful of our lane, we're being mindful of what our organizations and the CDC guidelines that are coming out and what the university is saying. It's just a slippery slope, especially as from a house corporation or the housing entity and how we say it and what we're saying is that we don't necessarily open ourselves to some liability or get out of our lane that was unintentional and that we didn't mean to do. So it's a great uh, it's a great webinar. It's out there. It's 45 minutes. It's not long, and they hit all those key points. So as we go through this with Bill, I would just really encourage you guys to to keep that in mind from a legal standpoint. We do want to communicate. We don't necessarily want to be like we're walking on eggshells or worry so much about the liability piece, but it is something that you need to be mindful of before you put anything out there in writing. Fantastic. Hey, thank you, William. Yeah. Well, that's great to point out, you know, and that's why I want to emphasize when you kind of stay in your lane, you know, we like to deal, there is a gray area and where I'm putting out, hey, you want to be specific, but yet general. And it is a bit of a contradiction. People want answers, but you have to be sort of aware of how direct some of these answers can be. Because the minute you may put something out at this present time, we don't know what the future is going to be, uh, whether schools will shut down, whether we'll have you know, uh, the return of really the virus. So that's where you really got to 
kind of be careful. And that was another good point, Woody, that I failed to bring up uh, due to my nervousness. This communication also is internally, right? We're talking about externally, but internally you're meeting and you're listening to not only, you know, your fellow advisors, you're listening to what's going on in the university level, as well as, you know, from a national level. So you're understanding all of us, what we're trying to communicate, what we're able to communicate, when our next communication is, because you have to plan it. And it is a fluid situation. So you have internal communication amongst your peers and as well as externally to the parents and the students. Awesome. Seven weeks. Um, now it's what's going to change. You know, you, you, you've talked about how you're preparing. So you've talked about what you've done. You talk about where you want to go, some of the goals of, you know, how you want to facilitate the safe environment. Now we're discussing possible changes. They're aware of them. Uh, and some of these highlights you can share or not share, again, depending upon some of the direction from our volunteers and national board, but has occupancy changed? Are, you know, are the quads gone? Are we done with uh, the sleeping, uh, the cold, cold dorms, guests at a house policy, common areas, dining room? Remember, every issue you direct, you address directly will have other consequences. If you state, hey, you know what, cold air dorms are no longer, be prepared to have an answer, where do these students go? So you, that's where you're trying to find that balance of communicating, uh, but aware of what you communicate, you need to make sure you can provide some of those answers when they come back with questions. Uh, and these are some of the areas that you know, when you work with, you know, the volunteers, the National Housing Corporation, local housing corporations, you can work together on it. So we talk about changes for the fall. Again, you know, what PPP expectation, PPE, excuse me, expectations and plans for members and staff, how we're going to handle the social distancing protocols. This is where you're bringing them up to speed. This is where you're introducing some of these uh, topics. Uh, internally, uh, one thing you do want to be aware of, you need to start reaching out to your vendors to receive their action plans and policies. Seven weeks out, you know, school's gonna start. So what policies require additional action by the house? Are we removing chairs from the dining room? Are we scheduling our cleaning services? Are we, do we need to purchase any additional equipment? You know, will your vendors provide or help you source your equipment list? Uh, what other pieces of equipment you need to provide? You know, cleaning supplies. So you're starting to get out in front of it. I know Woody and Steve and CSL has, you know, been on top of, uh, you know, what supplies you need. And this has to begin right now. So internally, you're talking amongst your peers. You're getting everything behind the scenes ready to go for that for the students to return. Five weeks out, uh, we're now focusing on more of the individual students. Uh, we want to be calming. So from this perspective, it's starting to transition from preparation to the delivery of a safe house. So we're in this delivery, you know, we're focused on their mental and physical health of the students. You know, and with that, uh, your list, you know, your, your, excuse me, with that, uh, you're sharing campus and, and local news. Uh, you, you're sharing updated cleaning protocols, your, your frequency, who owns that. You're encouraging individual house corporations and or senior leadership to start reaching out to their students, to their peers, to say, how you doing? Checking in. I'm excited to return in the fall. How are you doing? Uh, everyone's starting to get their plans booked, you know, when they're returning to campus. So this is where you can start listening. Uh, utilize your network of volunteers. Utilize your peers. Listen to their best practices they're doing on these various campuses. And as well as you're starting to pay really close attention to the governing bodies and their guidance. You know, this is where the universities by this point in time should be communicating to their general student population. So a lot of this resources should be on their website, their newsletter. You know, you're tracking what the state and local guidance is because they're getting more and more specific. They're starting to develop these plans each and every day. They're making announcements of when schools are starting, when they're ending but they're also starting to address these specific issues that you can take guidance uh, for your chapter. Now we're at four weeks. Um, this is when you're doing an internal progress check. 
Is the house ready and are the vendors ready to go? Have the supplies you've ordered arrived? Are you OSHA compliant? Is anything on back order? Uh, you begin to communicate move-in dates and schedules with your vendors. So internally, you're going through that checklist to start marking off the dates till you start. So you have creating, as we go through this process, you're creating your own SOP, and you're starting to identify potential gaps or where you gotta speed up the process in order to make sure this environment is safe once again and ready to, uh, you know, ready for the students to arrive. Externally, you're starting to share, okay, here's our move-in policies and scheduling. You know, this is going to be a fun, fun time for all of you, especially the larger chapters of how many people can be coming through the doors at once, how long your move-in schedule is going to be, uh, how many weekends, how many days, different time zones, uh, excuse me, different times of the day. And at this time, you're also relaying any specific changes to the house. How is it going to operate uh, regarding physical distancing? If you're going to do temperature checks, you know, these are really where now you get into the nuts and bolts of specific policy changes. I foresee this, you know, by this four weeks ago, having clear guidance, not only from the university, from our nationals, and also state and local. Right now, it's not there, but I prepare for this to, to come out really over the next few weeks all at once and have these guidelines set. So this is where you're really starting to check this stuff and making sure that you're coordinating not only vendors, but now you're coordinating the students for their move-in four weeks out. Bill, can I jump in? Uh, yeah, jump in all yeah, the time, Woody. I don't like to hear myself talk too much. This, so, good. This is, this is a really key point that, again, we just come across in the last two or three days. So it's really timely what you're saying here is that what we're hearing, at least from a handful, I don't want to say like we've heard from hundreds of universities, we're just – We've had the opportunity to listen in on a few recent conversations that universities have had with their fraternity and sorority uh, communities directly, and we expect more and more will be coming. And what we have heard, so this is just really important as you're working with your house corporation board and your national organization, and, and we will certainly be doing it with our clients as well, is the university may ask for something in writing in terms of your preparation preparation for the fall. So save yourself some time and effort as you're putting these stuff together. Go ahead and organize it in a manner that you can easily share with your, in terms of communication, that we can easily share with our university. Hey, here are our plans for move-in. Here are our plans for the fall and what we have done and the contingencies and how we've been able to modify our house to provide a safe environment. And here's what our plan will be if someone tests positive. So your point's just right there. I think within that four week, you certainly need to can be drafting it and working on it. Uh, I don't know that you wanna finalize it because lo and behold, right when you finalize it, we know the universities are going to be communicating, hey guys, this is what we'd really love to see you guys accomplish before your members move in. So you might as well leave some room and some flexibility to add how you can respond to those requests but certainly be far enough along to where you in, you include whatever items you didn't already have that meet your specific campus deal and turn that thing in and check that box. Great Sorry, point. Scott. This is a, now this is a good opportunity also to, uh, to promote next week's session, frankly. Uh, we're gonna be diving into this <laughs> slide. We're gonna be diving into this next week where we're talking about, you know, this. Uh, move in makeover. So, uh, cause it is going to look a lot different. Bill brings up some great points here where like, this is going to be a hap, this is going to have to be a much more coordinated effort than we've ever seen before, where we're literally giving students very specific times when they can move in and we're coordinating that based on the floor that they're on, uh, the room that they have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it's important for us to have that plan and for us to be able to communicate that to our students so that they know exactly what to expect when they get back again bill's earlier point was we got to start socializing how things are going to be different well if we've done some legwork up front we started to socialize how things aren't going to be quite the same then that helps when we make uh announcements and provide plans like this they're not caught so off guard by it. like oh yeah you told me things are going to be different so this is just one of the ways so i uh, love that thanks for jumping in there woody bill turn it back over to you 
No, I, I was on a call uh, on Wednesday with Northwestern University talking about changes, or they're telling us the changes for the fall. One of the things that we discuss from a local house corporation is, is do we need a COVID-19 room? And we're starting to problem solve that. And then we looked at each other and said, wait a minute, we can problem solve all we want, but the university may provide guidance. They may provide a certain dorm. They may say they have to leave campus or they may say they stick in your fraternity or sorority house. So some of these roadblocks and challenges you're gonna see, I'm not advocating at times just a wait and see approach, but it may be better to wait and see, right? There's gonna be certain specific details that the university may provide guidance down the road. It doesn't mean you can't get out in front of it with different solutions, but you wanna spend your energy where you can spend your energy and your time. You can't solve everything that, or anticipate everything that's gonna go on when we start in mid-August. And that's one of the things that we're discussing, again, as a local house corporation board, uh, even regarding dining, regarding, you know, are we gonna go single occupancy? Some of these stuff will be determined by uh, the national and or the university. And over the next few weeks, they're gonna start coming out with more and more stuff. They're just setting their dates recently, and I think they're gonna give us more direction on how they want to do it. We're not happy at Northwestern because they're potentially talking about single occupancy, so that brings a whole mess of options financially, uh, but that's, you know, some of the stuff will be dictated to us. Just give you the heads up. But I agree with Woody and, and Scott when they're talking about move-in. That's going to be a logistical, coordinated effort that you need to start planning for. I wish you the best. All right, we're uh, three weeks in. All right, we start to move into really individualized communication. And when I say individualized, you're kind of, you're gathering information that directly affects, you know, uh, moving uh, your students in the chapter house that they may have potential issues with. So you're signing move-in dates and schedules with the membership. You're being flexible because they may have different blocks so they're unable to do it. You're gathering information, uh, of potentially, I don't want to touch health issues, but dietary restrictions. If there's anything that, you know, your food service needs to be aware of allergies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, any individual members that may have been affected by occupancy, uh, you're com communicating to them. Uh, you're also, you're confirming with your vendor dates and schedules for additional cleaning and preparation for the move-in. And there's open lines of communication from the members and their families to ensure all their questions, concerns have been met and that you are ready to deliver the facility. Now you notice throughout this communication plan, I haven't really delved into your response. Uh, that could be a whole nother seminar idea, Scott, is how do you respond with yes and, and how do you deal with you know, students who are disappointed if they have to move rooms or parents who are unhappy that 10 families. Somebody to do it, and that's an immediate priority for us. We will hit on that one next week. Go ahead, Bill. I have to unmute myself on the computer. That's the trick, so I apologize. Uh, I, I didn't hear the question, so I'm unable to answer it, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not here to give guidance on, on directly response. I was just stating that something that people have to be prepared for is you not only work with the university on how flexible they are, but also your students and the flexibility uh, that you have is preparing for them to return. Students are returning. They want to come back. I mean, I can't tell you in my neighborhood of how many college age students are back on campus because their internships fell through and their parents are sick and tired of being around the house for the past 90 days. So they're ready to start and they're ready to go in uh, to your facility. So that I can guarantee. Uh, now we got 10 days, uh, 10 days to go. This is your mental checklist as advisors, as facility directors, as house directors to ensure that whatever forms you've needed are printed, quote unquote, I'm not touching waivers, whatever waivers you need, everything's ready to go. Uh, if you're gonna do surveys when students come back about, hey, what they wanna see change, what they wanna add to this experience, that's ready to go. You've assigned a timeline for when you're gonna do a check for PP inventory. You're starting to plan ahead of the next order when you potentially have to do that. You're marking on your calendar. You're assigning timelines to evaluate 
receive feedback, and possibly improve. So you're getting ready for this communication. If I didn't mention it earlier, communication is two-way. So we want to make sure we're listening to our students about what they're seeing, experiencing, and improvements we can make because they may come up with the easiest solution because we've been knee deep in it for the entire summer. So sometimes a fresh set of eyes are gonna be like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. We should put this here, we should do it that way. Uh, so this is where you're really getting prepared to open yourself up for not only them to arrive, but to make sure they have means and they have avenues that they can provide feedback and, um, you know, and, and a better understanding of what they're going through. Um, what do we got? Move-in day expectations according to the uh, form, and we're moving to day of the move-in. All right, let me get to that slide. Uh, all right, move-in day. Uh, this is where I think this is a big deal. Uh, this is where you can create some engagement with your members. Uh, the Greek experience, as they knew it, is different upon their return. So can you create an engagement sheet, or excuse me, a, an idea sheet, uh, you know, that you can still interact? Can you create game nights? Can you create certain food theme nights? Can you do things where you can still, uh, you know, grow the chapter personally, personally, you can still engage with other members uh, within the guidelines that you set forth in your protocol? Uh, so, you know, you're also thanking everyone for their patience. Uh, we knew all along we didn't have all the answers, and thank you for understanding. Uh, you, you know, you appreciate uh, them really during this difficult time because we're all struggling with it emotionally, and as well as you're providing any updates and news from the university that could possibly change. You know, that would be related to when they're going to, you know, if they're doing virtual classes, when they may shift in policies, uh, and, you know, providing updates on a daily basis. Yeah, Bill, one of the things that uh, we discussed yesterday, I think was a really important point that you guys brought up, uh, is every couple of weeks is doing a, a doing a revisit to local community university guidelines to make sure what you've been communicating is still valid. So it's uh, I think it's really important to give everybody that reminder is to continually be up to speed on what the university is sharing because their, their, their plans started rolling out. When we started seeing universities making announcements, Oh, close to a month ago, and some are a little quicker than others, and uh, and some of those plans that we saw originally announced are already kind of changing. So it's really important that we keep our eye on this moving target, and that we confirm on an ongoing basis that what we just communicated to our members and their families that that information is still relevant. This next slide, um, I'm going to lean on Woody uh, for a second here. Because uh, we do need to give some consideration to communicating proactively. Hey, what happens if we we do have a you know God forbid uh, a, an, a, an abrupt closing of the chapter house and we have to send everybody home uh, on, on the uh, on this you know on a dime just like we did back in the spring. So I want to have Woody talk just for a second about that, and uh, and then we'll move on. We'll get back into some standard operating procedures that Bill has to recommend. Woody. Yeah, so what as we were developing this program with Bill and working through the sequencing, one of the things that came up, we will be participating and presenting a webinar next next week with our friends from MJ Insurance. They had reached out about what to do and what our recommendations are and how to handle a house that may be sitting vacant much longer uh, than it normally does, whether it's over a winter break or summer break uh, type situation, and what are some of the contingencies that need to be in there. And it got us thinking, as Scott's point is, okay, so what, uh, from a communication standpoint, you can certainly participate in the webinar next week if you want to see about the operational and the logistics behind it, but from a com communication lens, what are the things that we need to be thinking about and we need to be uh, illustrating in anything that we put out there when a building or when we do have to shut down, whether it's because the house core of the organization makes the call because there's just been too many cases of COVID-19, the university shut us down, whatever the mandate from the city, however, what are those different pieces that we need to be prepared now to communicate? So when we talk about the facility, you're gonna need to be able to communicate when the facility is actually gonna be shutting down, when the, uh, how the facility will be accessible if for some reason we shut down so quickly not everybody can get their stuff 
So when will they anticipate to hear when you will communicate back to them? Point number two, when will they hear from you about and how frequently will they hear from you about when they can get back or, or what's their scenario as it relates to their personal belongings? As many of you on this phone had to deal with previously when, when the original shutdown went. So having that communication and what we learned from six to eight weeks ago, what can we utilize and be prepared for moving forward? Also from a security standpoint. So uh, understanding and communicating not only to the members and the uh, house corporation and the organizations as a whole, but also back to the university, the local police, uh, letting them know, hey, our house is gonna be empty at this period of time and can we get some extra patrols? Uh, but also showing and demonstrating what you're doing to ensure the house is secure, either through your alarm, security cameras, things of that nature communicating to the residents what their processes will be. And so they understand, hey, if we are to shut down now, or if we get, I'm sorry, if we are asked to shut down um, in, a, in a moment's notice, as Scott said it, this is what you need to understand will be the process. This is how we're gonna handle your stuff. This is how we're gonna move and, and work, getting everybody out in a safe and orderly manner. And this is what we'll be communicating throughout the process. So just giving them a heads up now and communicating what that will look like uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about when we're doing a project management uh, for a client and it's a major renovation and now we've just moved everybody back in, right? Or it's a brand new house. And so we bring all the members in the house and out of house members to the house and talk through what does it mean and how do operations look within this house? We're communicating what that's going to be different. I would say, especially uh, as you kick off the new year and as Scott, or I'm sorry, as Bill has been talking about, it's gonna be different. So it is certainly reasonable to gather everyone, probably through a Zoom meeting or something to observe social distancing, but get everybody on the same page and take that opportunity to communicate to them, hey, if we shut down, this is what it's gonna look like. Same to your staff, if you have a cleaning staff, if you have a kitchen staff that you're, especially as your role as a house director that you oversee, make sure you've communicated to them what it'll look like. And then also to your vendor partners, be, be uh, proactive now in developing what those pieces will be in terms of what they can expect, access if their services could be limited. This is probably what we'd be looking to. Wanna make sure you're gonna be flexible because we know when we shut down, we're gonna go right back into that cash preservation minimizing expenses so being able to communicate what they can expect and what they can be seeing uh, is really important so as we were developing next week and we we're thinking through this there's a lot of communication elements that you could be talking through and preparing for now between now and august that you already got ready and you can ship out in the moments notice if something unfortunately does happen and we do shut down awesome thank you for that woody <clears throat> all right bill talk to us talk us through standard operating procedures Great, I will. I'm going to uh, tangent quickly, Scott, if you allow me, uh, in anticipate, anticipation of a potential question. Uh, one of the things I didn't touch upon is quickly, you know, the form of communication and really how you're doing it. Uh, the things we're talking about, there are a lot of subjects. So I would recognize that you don't try and hit five subjects in an email. You know, it's much better off especially with my attention and lack thereof, you know, you want to keep it short, you want to keep it brief and direct to the point. If we are start communicating an entire manual or three pages, the students uh, and even parents necessarily won't look through it. So number one, let's keep it concise. And if we have to do more regular communication to make up, with all, make up for all the topics, err on that side. Number two, make sure we're communicating with the student leadership you know, in advance of sending this communication out because they can then share it within their own chat rooms, WhatsApp app, whatever they have. So they're, you're abiding by that rule of seven. We're gonna have to communicate this thing seven times, but it's in a very short window. And it will be potentially frustrating when you share it. If we use, for example, move-in dates, we wanna make sure we get a confirmation back that yes, they listened, they heard, we're good to go, I got it, I'm clear. So that's just something I would advise as you go and tackle you know, these pieces and as you unpack it all, there's a lot that you could put out on a daily basis. You don't wanna overwhelm people, but you wanna make sure, quote unquote, you do over communicate and we're due being clear and concise. So Scott, I just wanna to touch upon that. Oh, that's great, thank you. 
Uh, now we move into the post move in. This is the really fun part, right? We get to build an SOP. You know, you're building your chapter's own operating procedures for COVID-19. Uh, but guess what? You already have them. You know, if you look at, well, I'll just take Campus Cooks, for example, we have an infectious disease protocol. When COVID-19 uh, reared its ugly head in March, we just, uh, we pivoted on it, added a couple points, and there's your COVID-19 policy. So you already have a majority of these uh, SOPs. You're currently cleaning your facility. You're currently uh, probably have a linen vendor, et cetera, et cetera. So you're just, you're just, um, I would say, you know, um, tweaking it. And when you do it, you know, when you build out your SOP, you're going to include in that some communication because we have to learn what we experienced in March and build it in as Woody said, if something were to happen in the future. Here's a summary of final thoughts. Um, we want to talk about really, we, we mentioned 60 days out. We're just talking a cadence, whether it's weekly, biweekly, every 15 days, you want to create a cadence. We want to communicate our progress and what we're going to do. We then want to talk about changes and potentially how they affect the membership. And then within 30 days, we're talking more about individual members and how they're affected by uh, move in and expectations and also physical distancing. And then 15 days out, we're trying to get prep uh, for that move in and as well as starting to listen and see how we can enhance the Greek experience. You know, something to think about and keep in mind, you know, on the student's mind is how will school be different? You know, from their perspective, uh, they go to school every year. They've been trained for the past 18, 19, 20 years, fall ends, we go to school. So it isn't like we're re-onboarding uh, employees, workers who are coming from re remote back to the office. That's something new for many of us. But the students are already in that pattern. The thing that it is, that it's not the same as it used to be. So I would look at how you have to re-onboard these students into your chapter house when they arrive. You know, we can talk about meetings. Again, we can talk about engagement pieces like surveys. It's just there, so be aware of it. And the last thing I really want to talk about is celebrate, right? Everyone's back. Everyone's excited. Uh, we put in a lot of work, not only on the clothes, but in that preparation delivery and now maintaining the facility. So it's a good time for the chapter to celebrate, celebrate uh, with your peers because it's great we're back. And it's a tremendous thing that we're back at school because nothing is like the collegiate experience. Awesome. awesome. Uh, the last thing before I finish up, uh, last three questions you do want to think about is looking at the Greek experience and how that can help reduce our students' anxiety? How can we help them come back to school and feel safe, feel engaged? Uh, number two, you know, when we rebuild this, you know, where are we starting? You know, what should we keep doing as a chapter? You know, do we need to change anything, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And then as well, this time away, what is it revealed about my chapter's culture? You know, what has been the strength that's come out of it? How have we bonded via Zoom or how have we stuck together? So it's a good introspective time to look at the culture of the chapter and see what it's revealed. Thank you, Scott. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Uh, well, let's, let's dive into some, some Q&A here. Uh, Christina, what are you seeing over in the chat room? I haven't seen any questions yet. Uh, somebody did ask if we could provide the link to the replay for the Pennington and Fraternal Law Call. Mm -hmm. I did go ahead and put the link to Pennington's website in that specific webinar in the chat. Uh, it does say if you fill out the form, then you can access the video. Perfect, thank you for doing that. And if anybody has any questions and wants to go ahead and put them in the chat, then I will let you know. Well, well, while you're taking a look at that, I know I've got a few, and uh, these were a few that uh, that we've been thinking through, and we just want to kind of put uh, Bill on the hot seat here. And so, uh, Bill, as you're um, uh, you know, as you're you know, as you're communicating with your clients, what are some of the key messages that 
uh, that you and folks like you are communicating with local house corporations and with national house corporations. I think it would be helpful for our audience to know some of those things so they can kind of get a feel for the type of information they might want to start communicating to their members. So what are some of those key messages? Sure, thanks for the hot seat. Uh, the first thing that we're really getting asked about is flexibility. You know, flexibility on start dates, flexibility on contract cancellations, flexibility really on payment schedule, and flexibility regarding costs. So that's directly, you know, from my perspective, is how, and from your perspective, it'd probably be how flexible are we gonna be, you know, to our students, you know, and what does that flexibility look like? Uh, the second thing is, is preparing the chapter. Right now, everyone's still in that preparation mode, and they're slowly starting to transition in, okay, what does this now look like when we deliver? So from our perspective is, hey, how do we prepare the kitchen in terms of training, in terms of dietary restrictions? You know, what does service look like in terms of now in the delivery? What is service looking like, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the two things that we're talking about is A, flexibility, and second, that prepare, now we're into delivery, and then shortly we'll be in maintenance. Awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, that's actually a good segue. So let's. Uh, the second question I kind of had teed up for you here were was you know specifically in terms of um, changes that you're going to see in the kitchen and, and dining room. What are what are the biggest ones you see coming about, and how are you communicating that to your customers and your customers' customer? Yeah, this is the interesting one where you want to be specific yet general. You know, we're going to recommend uh, just from a service standpoint that we start off the semester with single service, uh, you know, where it's always easier to dial it. It's, it's easier to ramp up than to dial it back. You know, so our concerns are for the students' health and our staff as well. And that's why we're gonna to go to really touchless single service as we start the year. And as I say that, again, it's dependent on state and local guidelines and by that chapter. But that is what I think most of the food service programs would be recommending, or, you know, and that's specifically regarding the salad bar and those pantry areas. But I'm taped now, I am now quoted saying that, and now as Bill Reader said, they're just gonna do single service and the menu is decided by campus cook. So you gotta be careful when you when you talk in definitive, Scott. Sure, no, I get it. No, I, I will say <laughs> not, not just campus cooks, but I think everybody in your industry, your uh, all the folks that you, um, it's really interesting to, to, I love the seat that we sit in because we get to work with all of you. We get to work with you and all of your competitors. And uh, so we've got a really good view of what everybody's doing. and. I will tell you, all of the folks that um, are in your little community of food service providers have done an extraordinary job of helping prepare for this fall. So we need to stop right now and just say thanks to you and all of those who uh, wear that hat that you wear and say thank you because uh, it's such a huge part of what's happening in our chapter houses and the way you guys have all stepped up to do such extraordinary work this summer to make sure that we're ready for this fall has been really wonderful to see. And so I just wanted to let you know how grateful we are for all the work that you guys have done uh, preparing us for this this fall, because it has not been easy. It has not been easy. So I do have another couple of questions for you, but I, I wanna uh, skip, jump on, and because uh, we're getting short on time. Uh, Christina, did you see any other questions pop up? Yeah, so we've had several questions pop Great. up. Okay, uh, I think you addressed, they, um, someone had asked if Campus Cooks, like what would Campus Cooks be doing differently in their kitchens this year? You kind of touched on it. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add there. Uh, again, we've had infectious disease protocols uh, written, part of our playbook. We are also OSHA compliant. So what we're looking to do is just further augmenting that training for the chef. Uh, retraining, quote unquote, to ensure we're doing that. Uh, we're also looking at obviously service. Uh, you know, how does that look like? You know, and I just mentioned that whether it's full service, uh, plated or single service in terms of, you know, placing containers. Uh, so, you know, those have been our focus. And as we're writing our guidebooks and sharing our materials, we need to prepare the kitchen. 
we need to deliver the food service and we need to maintain. So things we've adjusted, of course, are back to, you know, focusing on our seven keys uh, daily, you know, implementing now temperature checks for your staff, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to, you know, go on to a litany of things, but it's all with the with guys that we need to be, you know, we need to look out for our student safety as well as the safety of the staff. And I would and I would let everyone know too on our website, again to Scott's point, the, the kitchen management companies have been great. And we've been capturing and they've been so kind to share their SOPs and other documents they've developed. We've captured them and we've loaded them into our COVID-19 site. So they're there for you to view. All right, thank you, Eddie. Christina, what else are you seeing? Give me one more. Uh, well, we've got several more. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, should food service and custodial vendors be expected to test their staff prior to starting and through just continuously throughout the year? There's some legal stuff with that, so I don't want to get over my skis uh, regarding HR. Uh, we are looking into, obviously, I mentioned temperature checks for our staff. You know, how, what is what you're able to do in a return to work environment uh we are looking to do that on a daily basis we of course have to run through when you look at that hr and attorneys because ever if there are unintended consequences it's the same thing to a return to work uh if you're looking for employees and students how much can you ask them with temperature checks how much can you ask your employees when they turn to the workplace have you been having these symptoms so there will be ways to do it Meaning you can probably ask, and I'm, I don't want to get, that's probably a better question for MJ or I could get the director of HR on. There will be questions and ways you can do it, and that's what we're figuring out. But yes, we're looking to, of course, you know, uh, temperature check our employees to make sure that they are, you know, safe when they're there at work. Perfect. Uh Another question was, what will happen when one member tests positive? Does the entire house have to quarantine for 14 days? Or what if one kitchen worker tests positive? Does everyone in the kitchen have to quarantine? Yeah, Woody, why don't you take the uh, first part? Yeah, of that Woody, why, yeah, you handle the students, Woody. Uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, so that those are that's going to be driven by the university that's going to be driven by the organization and the house corporation and so again as we've stated from the beginning in all the different calls and all the different webinars that have been held the idea or thought or concept has been if we if they don't uh if they can't if we can get them out of the house and get them back home and quarantine at home that would be great uh, and then dealing with the aftermath of that with the facility, certainly cleaning the room where that individual was. And if they have a roommate, uh, probably makes sense. And all universities are working very hard to make sure testing's available for that person to get tested. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna be seeing is that the universities are gonna ask in partnership. And we've talked a little bit about this. And again, we've even kind of gone back and forth, but we're now seeing clarity on this is that the universities are going to want to see in partnership where possible that fraternities and sororities are tracking guests. Uh, it's becoming more and more clear that uh, residence halls are going to probably not allow any visitors. It's going to be just residents and staff because, again, in one mind, you're thinking, well, that seems unreasonable. But the other side of the standpoint is it probably makes sense just from having to do contact tracing. If there is an outbreak, at least early on in the process. So they're certainly going to be looking at uh, fraternities and sororities where possible to help them because if someone does test positive in the facility, they're going to want to know who the visitors were. They're going to want to know who the staff is and so that they can communicate to those individuals to limit their movement to maybe get tested and to quarantine where they can uh, possibly. Uh, so there are still conversations going on about quarantining the entire facility. Uh, we've already seen some universities talking about if one member in a residence hall gets tested positive that uh, they're talking through do they quarantine the entire residence hall for that 14 period 14 day period and i think that's going to evolve a little bit as they learn more about the virus and as they understand more about the logistics on their campus 
to be able to handle these types of situations. So there's more out there, but I can tell you right now that everyone would love for that person to quarantine somewhere elsewhere. I can tell you it's going to be very difficult. We've talked about this a little bit in previous calls that if that person doesn't want to comply and they want to quarantine in their room that they have a signed lease for doing so, uh, that can get very sticky and messy uh, because the ability to move them around in that facility, I'll refer you back to last Wednesday's, this past Wednesday's webinar, is, is tricky. So, and I can tell you that they're going to want us to help participate as it relates to tracking who's coming in and, the, in, and, in and out of the house from a visitor standpoint, if you do allow visitors and out of house members as best as possible, at least on the early end. So as it relates to Bill, in terms of your team, if someone tests positive on the staff, certainly there's protocols that you guys are developing. Yeah, the main thing I want to point out, you know, all food service vendors, of course, are going to be <coughs> following you know, PPE, personal protection equipment, you know, they're going to be head to toe in what they're wearing. And as you ask the questions about temperature checks, that you ask the question, uh, you know, uh, really, you know, when I think of this webinar is, I just wrote, wrote this question down, what ability, what are we able to share with our chapters? You know, you have HIPAA implications of your staff, you know, cleaning crew comes down with COVID, what are you able to share? So that's an answer I don't have, but we will, you know, get that answer as we communicate that to our client, because they're again, I will default to Woody on what you're able to able to do legally, you know, regarding some of the information you're able to provide, you know, about individual health of your employees. Christina, you see anything else? We need to. Yeah, I have, to have one more, Christina. <clears throat> do what? We have time for one more. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Debbie asks a great question. Um, she wants to know what our thoughts are on 24-hour uh, availability to snack kitchens, um, shared microwaves, things of that nature. Oh, for me, uh, starting out, I would not uh, recommend uh, making uh, as we remember our snack kitchens and pantries, as they are were currently done uh, a couple of months ago, uh, that won't be uh, per, that won't be available as you initially start. Everything's going to be either a snacks part of a snack box students pick up uh, from the kitchen directly at the beginning of the week. They can go with the meal service. Secondly, and in some cases, depending upon the location and the state and the chapter, everything could be single service. Uh, if you need to within the snack area. But yes, you're not going to be able to dig your hand into a thing of trail mix or open boxes of cereal. You know, I, I'm not sure that would be a recommended practice. Right. Bill, I, I do want to ask one more, one more quick question, then we'll move on. Uh, and just a, a heads up for everybody that's on the call. When we talked about being nimble and maybe shifting some of our programming, uh, this is one of those topics. I know the, you know, what's happening in the kitchen and the dining room is a big topic. And this is going to be one where we will probably put Bill and a few of his counterparts uh, on a panel and we'll have a town hall about this very specific topic. So this is, I mean, this is a, we could spend hours just talking about uh, kitchen management specifically as to how we're going to navigate it going forward. So uh, one really quick question though, Bill, are, would you guys be doing or will, uh, food service providers, will they be doing temperature checks each day for their team that's in that kitchen? It's a part of our standard operating procedure. We also have to take the time, uh, what, again, I default to what you're able to check for and how you ask those questions according to HIPAA laws and potential legality issues. You know, I we are planning to it, again, within our SOPs, and I cannot answer, because we've just written it, of what we're allowed to do, but I know there's work around. Does that help you out, Scott? That does. Um, what we will do is, we'll, we'll. I'm sure that information is evolving, and we'll get a clear answer on that when we before we have this town hall and talking about uh, kitchen management, uh, dining room management, etc. So, um, what do you, Christina? Any other final thoughts? Well, I have one more thing, just one more question that I feel like is a good one that I think Woody can touch on maybe just really quickly. But um, 
it was, are there any best practices on how to determine who is prioritized for student housing with the caveat that some members might be displaced um, or any communication practices around those displaced students? How do you communicate that or ease maybe some anxiety surrounded around that? Yeah, I was reading that. Are they meaning displaced because they tested positive? Yeah. Kaya, I don't know if you can um, unmute and ask. Uh, Hi, no, sure. I was just speaking directly to, um, because we're changing quads to doubles now for the University of Maryland in particular, and triples to doubles as well, those students are going to be displaced. And so just wondering if there are any communication practices um, that folks have been utilizing when considering those students or just having the conversation with our a chapter leadership about how to communicate that we are going to have to prioritize specific students, maybe around specific needs, um, but just wondering if this has been any type of conversation y'all are having. Yeah, so we've had just a, a few on them, not, not a ton. And what we've heard at this point is that the communications have certainly been, to your point, chapter leadership base, advisor base first and foremost, and calls, right? This isn't necessarily something that you're just going to communicate out in writing. And so they have been having conversations exactly to your point of how they're going to prioritize those uh, that uh, could be displaced or have to go find housing otherwise. And they're working with the university too to help accommodate some of that. Now at the University of Maryland, it's a little unique because a lot of those houses, a large majority of them are considered university housing. So I'm going to guess there's going to be some flexibility into the ability, hopefully, to spread them across the campus just in other facilities. So they're still on campus. They're just unfortunately not in their fraternity sorority house. And those prioritizations have been, to, we've been in participation, participated in at least one of those conversations of how the prioritization might work. One is, does anybody want out? Does anybody want to be in a different facility? Because they may appreciate the fact of the ability to have a little bit more wiggle room where they're not really 100% comfortable in social distancing within the fraternity sorority house themselves. Uh, and then two, it's really been, they've lo looked at when they signed up originally, uh, where they are in their academic studies as it relates to progression, sophomore, freshman, et cetera. Uh, most organizations have point systems, so how they've been on points. So they're trying to be as fair and as reasonable as possible uh, in that, but I'm sure there's not going to be a, a perfect piece. But as the communication is, certainly the leadership side of it from all stakeholders, house corporation, advisors, organization, and chapter leadership. And then with that, there were going to be individual conversations directly with those impacted. Great. Thank you, Woody. Yep. Um, Bill, any final thoughts to share with the group before we wrap up? Sure. I know you're going to have uh, food service uh, webinars in the near future. You know, one of the questions that, that really is surrounding this food service, so one of the things I just want to follow up with is as you prepare your, your chapter house and things that we're doing, obviously we're having an opening checklist for cleaning and sanitizing the equipment. You know, we're setting up training. SOP for enhanced training on communicable disease protocol. Your food service providers are now looking at options for dining, you know, how the meals and snack beverage services are going to be delivered, uh, as well as personal protective equipment, signage, what goes into your dining room. And then when you get into maintenance, it's what you have to do the rest of the year. And these are continued cleaning and sanitation procedures, daily reports, SOPs, and with that staff and tune sick protocols SLP. So that's adherence as you're asking to self-wellness, monitoring, and in the case your staff is sick, coverage plan. All these companies are going through these things and they're vetting them right now and they can definitely be more definitive as we learn more not only from the university but you know state and locally. So hopefully that answers those questions for you know and sums it up for the individuals that were in the chat room. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, man, great, uh, great conversation day. Uh, before I start to wrap up, I just want to thank uh, Bill for spending some time with us today. Uh, incredible job, great, uh, great information in terms of how to break down your communications in by topic and in small doses and the, the cadence with which we need to be sharing that information. So 
Bill, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. You're so, welcome, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we'll do it again sometime. So just a couple quick uh, thoughts as we wrap up. I want to encourage you, if you haven't started these communications, if you haven't developed your plan and started to execute on it, start now. Uh, start now, start now. And then Bill Earl mentioned earlier uh, to keep the messages concise. I used to, uh, I had a, um, a boss once upon a time tell me, you got to make your emails scroll friendly. And uh, if I've got to scroll up my screen twice to read your entire message, I'm not going to read it. So as you're putting together your communications, keep your messaging tight. Say as much as you can with as few words as possible so that they are more likely or most likely to read your entire message. Um, the last few things I'd share with you is uh, make sure you're using the right channel for the right person at the right time. The channels that you're going to use to communicate with your members probably are a little different than what you're going to use to communicate with their parents. For instance, we know that students are probably using GroupMe or WhatsApp or they're, they're in a group text. Uh, parents are much going to be much more likely to be email focused. So really make sure that you're using the right channel based on the audience that you're trying to reach. And then the last thing, just work with your local house corporation, your national house corporation, so that you all have absolute clarity on the message that is being presented, when it's supposed to be presented, and what the implications of that message specifically is. So um, with that being said, I do want to give you a quick heads up on next week. Uh, a quick look ahead for next Friday, we're going to be diving into move over or move in makeovers. So we hit on this a little bit earlier. Man, when we start talking about how things are going to be different, this is one of those specific reasons or one of those specific areas where we know there's going to be massive changes in terms of how we coordinate and manage the move-in process. So we want to invite you back next week as we dive into that. And we'll be leaning on Christina to share some of her ideas and recommendations in terms of how to manage that process effectively. Until then, again, we want to encourage you to always stay in touch. If there are questions that you have along the way, please feel free to reach out to us or go check out our website. We've got a lot of this industry-wide information that's available there on our Beyond COVID-19 page. So we'd encourage you to check that out. But until then, thanks again for all you're doing. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Go have yourself the best weekend ever, and we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Hi, Christina.